As our worship team is making their way down this morning, why don't you make best use of this time right now? And let's spend some moments in prayer. Just quiet prayer, you seeking the Lord. You know, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. But I want you to pray right now that God would speak to you today. He'd hit your heart, change your thinking, give you what you need today, what you're hungry for. Let's pray. Father, we began this series in this gospel book because we would see Jesus. Father, that's my prayer. We'd be reacquainted with the real Jesus because all of our ideas and notions sometimes cloud the reality of the revelation of Christ in Scripture, the picture of you, the face of God and the person of Christ. And so, Father, today we want to see you through Jesus. We want to know what, what real love is and real power looks like and what compassion that moves to action ought to do in us. And so, Father, I pray you take this word and, Father, we would just get it. I mean, we leave here with a sense, of, I get this, Father, because I, I get you in this and I see Jesus in this and I want to be, want to be like Jesus. And Father, for the person in this room that, that doubts this morning, I pray that faith would come to them like a divine gift. And for the person who, who doubts their, their worth in your eyes, who wonders if they're too far from you or out of your reach, I pray that they would see that nothing could be farther from the truth. And Father, for the person in this room who loves doctrine but doesn't always love people, or even you, I pray that what we would see here today would change our heart and that we would do this, not just consider it or understand it, but do it. And so, Lord, on behalf of all the people listening, but mostly for myself, I submit to your word and to your spirit. Do what you will in us. I pray, I pray, Father, for your glory and because we know it will be for our good and for the sake of so many around us who don't know the real you. I pray you'd make these things so in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text today is Mark chapter 1 uh, and verse 40. You know, in the busyness of this gospel, Mark's gospel, as you've seen, one of the most common words that appears again and again in Mark's gospel is immediately. So over and over, we see Jesus moving from action to action, event to event, group to group. The pace is fast. The gospel's quick moving. As you probably learned early on in the series, as if you're part of one of our life groups, you would have heard already that the first half of Mark's gospel is all prelude to the second half from chapters 9 on. It's all that final week of Christ. Everything building to the purpose of why Christ came and what he did. And so we, we look for these snapshots you know, along the way, giving us a glimpse of Christ. Who is he really? What's he really like? What does he want? What does he do? What's our response to him? And this is one of those powerful snapshots in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. Let's talk for a moment about leprosy in the first century. I don't want to belabor the point. There's a lot of good information if you're interested in this sort of thing, skin diseases and whatnot. But leprosy was a considerable issue in the time of Christ, the, the time of the Gospels. Lepers were victims of far more than just the disease itself, robbed of their health, robbed of their family relationships, robbed of their occupations, their normal routines, Robbed of fellowship with friends, robbed of a worshiping community, the effect was significant. Scripture tells us in Leviticus that in order to mark themselves so that no one else would be infected or affected by them, they physically had to make themselves as repugnant as possible. They had to look the part, even. Josephus, the great historian, speaks of the banishment of lepers in the first century as, in no way, he said, differing 
from a corpse. You may remember that Miriam was cursed with leprosy for speaking out against Moses and Moses' uh, new bride from Ethiopia. And the curse was leprosy. Um, scholars since then, rabbis since then, described lepers like Miriam as, quote, the living dead. These people suffered without hope of any relief. Now, there were a wide range of skin diseases. I think we'd be remiss to try to diagnose with just a few verses from Scripture. But historically, we would say there are probably at least 74 different types of skin diseases, not all of them malignant. But there is a manual given to the priests who had the sole responsibility of diagnosing this disease. Leviticus 13 and 14 reads sort of like an ancient dermatology handbook. And when they diagnosed or determined the certain ones that were malignant, those malignant ones were separated out. At worst, people who suffered from leprosy had horrific pain and eventually significant physical disfigurement. And at the least, again, even those whose appearance was not significantly marred were cut off. They were cut off and shut out of religious life altogether. It doesn't mean they didn't have hope of heaven, but it meant that they could not engage in any temple worship or activities with other believers. They were shunned from community life could not work in typical jobs, could not be around regular people. They were often considered cursed. I spoke of Miriam in Numbers 12, verse 10. For those of you who have a keen memory for Old Testament text, 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 29, a curse was placed on Joab for wrongfully killing Abner, David's general. And the curse placed on Moab was something like this, that for the rest of their generations, that there would always be at least one leper in the house of Joab. Even Naaman who was healed in 2 Kings chapter 5, was considered to be cursed. And of course, biblically, spiritually, socially, functionally, they were pronounced unclean. Unclean. That made them untouchables. That made them undesirables. That made them the dregs of society. One portion of Leviticus, in those two chapters, 13 and 14, starting in verse 45, Leviticus describes their plight like this. The leprous person who has a disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. It just sounds like a modern hipster to me, but it's torn clothes, let the hair of his head hang loose. He shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine the indignity? And we talk so much about self-esteem and self-worth. Can you imagine that being your condition? You know, we're reading about the hundreds of people affected by coronavirus, hundreds of them trapped on a cruise ship. This was much worse. He shall remain unclean as long as he has a disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. We can say rightfully, if you had leprosy, you lived in desolate places, wherever people were not. And because the Jews believed there was only supernatural healing, not medicinal healing, they had one hope, God, one hope. If anything in their life was ever going to change, if their condition was ever going to be righted or remedied, it would have to come from God because there was no other way. There was no other way. So let's look at the storyline just for a moment. Let's revisit the text. An untouchable, conscious of his own state, earnestly desiring to be cleansed, humble enough to ask for cleansing, and believing that Jesus has the power to heal him, encounters the compassionate Jesus who does not shrink from laying his hand even on the loathsomeness of leprosy. This man with leprosy has an honest, sincere faith, an honest, humble, sincere faith, and he risks everything if you think about it for a moment. The law required them not only to identify themselves audibly, to make a mark of themselves visibly, but they were required to keep their distance from people. This was social and religious law, and he defies all of those customs He comes so close to Jesus where he's not supposed to be, what he's not supposed to do. And in abject humility, a person whose sense of worth has already got to be about as low as a person can be, and he gets on his knees before Jesus. And he says one of the great statements of New Testament faith I think you'll find. I think it is a great prayer for any of you in this room who are praying for something for God to do, praying for something with honest humility, with sincerity. Here's what he said, if you will, you can. And that's awesome. I love that. This leper says to Jesus, if you will, you can. I know you can. The question is, will you? Is this your will? If you will, you can. And look at Jesus' response. How many of you have a word in your text? 
I know if you have the ESV, as I've read to you, I know what the word is. Um, how many of you have a word in your text that says Jesus responded with compassion? Raise your hand if your, your translation says compassion. Throw your hand up. Pity. We have the word pity. How many of you have an NIV Bible this morning? Just a few? NIV says he responded what? He said he was indignant. This is one of the interesting, puzzling words that we find in New Testament translation. If you were to read one of those studies about difficulties in ancient manuscripts, one of the key texts they would center on is, is this one, Mark 1, verse 41. The majority of our translations render the word compassion or pity. But as we find in the oldest manuscript, the translation for the word is actually anger or indignation. Now, it doesn't exactly fit with how we think Jesus' response would be. It's easy for us to make this a very superficial encounter. It's, it's almost as if in our modern reading, sort of our westernized concept, we see Jesus and he, and he sees this person in horrific condition, and we can only speculate because the Bible doesn't go into those kind of details. Whether his condition is as bad as anyone has ever seen or somewhere in the middle or less, we don't know. But we know it's deplorable. It's heartbreaking, right? If you have any heart at all, you look at that person with pity. And we can almost envision in our own minds Jesus saying something like, man, that's just terrible, man, I hate, I hate that. But I have the sense there's something more afoot here. Because Jesus' reactions and his responses in this whole encounter are not exactly what we would expect. After he heals him, he sends him away sternly with a stern warning. It's the same language of a demon being cast out. Now go from here and do exactly this. On the one hand, we applaud the man's honest, sincere faith, his humble faith. If you will, you can. But we also see his immature faith because as soon as he's healed, he goes and immediately disobeys. So what is the response here? You know, anger may not be as an offensive word as we might think if we recall in Judges 10, 16, the scripture says that God became indignant over the misery of Israel. What if Jesus' response was indignant pity? He sees the condition of the leper. And much as he was moved to a very visceral emotional response as he was with Lazarus in John chapter 11, Jesus is now moved to an indignant response. What is he indignant over? The treatment this man receives from so many? That he's cast out so easily? The disease itself and its effect on people? Or just the sense that this is not the way the world is supposed to be because this is not how I created it. Because I made everything perfect. And in that moment, a microcosm of brokenness. I made a world that was without sin or sickness or disease or death. And look what we have wrought upon it. But Jesus' response is emotional. As one commentator said, it's almost as if Jesus dispelled the leprosy with holy wrath. With holy wrath, he commands it, and he immediately is healed. The Bible says immediately the leprosy left, and he was cured. I was reading that text again and thinking through all the implications of this, and one thing just hit me so hard that I want to challenge you also with. In all the brokenness of this world, and all that that means hurting people, disadvantaged people, broken people. When was the last time you saw something or you saw someone that moved you to an indignant response? A response that says, it ought not be this way. I can't just look at this and feel a certain way. That This ought to create in me more than just a sadness or a response like, that's just terrible. Oh, I'm so sorry for you but it actually moved us to do something about it. When was the last time a hurting person, a broken person, a needy person, a disadvantaged person, an outcast person, moved you to look at their condition and said, you know what? I am going to respond. This is not what God intended. This is not the way God wants it to be. And if I'm going to be an emissary of the king in this world, if, if my life, my family, my church is going to be a small outpost of the kingdom of God, representing what God wills in this world, if I'm going to honestly pray even the prayer of the kingdom, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, then what am I going to do about it? When was the last time you saw something and said, I can't sit by? I've got to respond. So here you have this beautiful intersection in the gospel of Mark. In the business of all of Mark's, I mean, business of all of Jesus' life, through the vantage point of Peter, boom, 
there's a collision. You have this compassionate king with infinite power and a contrite, unclean sinner. And when those two things collide, his power and his willingness, our humility and our need, what happens? Healing. Healing. Well, what happens when the worst of us, all of our brokenness, all of our hurts, all of our troubles collide with he who is compassionate and indignant about our condition even as he was about Israel, that they should be this way. When those two things meet, healing. I guess as I was analyzing the text, one question that just seemed to beg itself for me was, why this particular miracle? I mean, why this one? It's just one encounter of many. We know that in John's gospel, that the Bible says that Jesus did many other things that are not recorded. If everything he said and did was recorded, we would not have enough books to contain them. So we know he did many things. Mark 1.34 says he healed many who were sick with various diseases. We read that a couple of weeks ago. Why this one? In the Gospels, we know that the recorded miracles are selective, right? They're selective. We don't have every single one, every single encounter, every single person. We have selective ones. So they're meant to teach us something. They reveal something that we, that we need to see. So why this one? I want you to sort of take your angle of Scripture, your view of the text here, and widen it out a bit. Consider big purposes for a moment. Here's a Gospel written primarily for the sake of Gentile people. This is a gospel message that would have gone out to the Romans and then spread from there. And in this gospel account, Mark's aim is to display Jesus as the Son of God. He is the Son of God, the rightful heir to the throne. He is the king. That's the purpose. So what is he displaying in this? Well, one, Jesus doing this miracle declares his messianic identity. He is the promised Messiah. Later on, John the Baptist. You remember John? Introduced to us in the first part of Mark's gospel. John, who was so full of faith. John, who was like that last of the Old Testament era of prophets declaring Jesus. This is the one. This is the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. This one who was so humble for Jesus, who said, you should be baptizing me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. I don't even deserve to unlace the ties on your shoes. Well, later on, this same John, through much struggle and travail, would have a bit of crisis of his own faith. It's good to know, by the way, folks, that even our wobbly faith is sustained by God. And so John the Baptist in prison apparently asked, will you guys go find out now? I mean, is Jesus really the one? I need to know for sure. I can imagine in that moment of, of crisis and you know, pain and difficulty, I'm about to lose everything for the sake of this. I, I just need the reassurance he's the one. Matthew 11, verse 2, describes it like this. When John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? Jesus answered him. Listen to his answer. Are you the one? The one I thought you were at the beginning? Or are, you, are you that one, or, or was I wrong? Look at Jesus' answer. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. He's quoting Old Testament prophecies about the identity of the Messiah. Let him know, here's the proof. And one of those proofs is lepers healed. This passage also displays the kingdom and the awesome power of the king. Here is the invading king into a broken world, a world broken by sin, and this is evidence of it. While we can't declare, and we would be wrong to say every person's disease and condition is a result of their sin, that would be horrific. You know, the disciples had that sort of opinion that many people in the first century did when they asked Jesus about a man born blind. Who sinned, right? You remember the story? Who sinned? This, this man or his, or his parents? And that's horrible. We do that same sort of thing sometimes. But to say that every sin is in, I mean, every disease is indirectly caused by sin, that would be correct. Because it is through sin that sin and then its effects came into this world. Through temptation and sin came disease and death. But now we see an invading king displaying his authority. This is the king, Jesus. It's his kingdom. He has awesome power. And that's on display here. Of course, we know deeper that the picture here of uncleanness, someone who can't worship, someone who can't be part of the people, someone who is cast off, cast out, this is a picture 
and a metaphor of sin. And it shows the power of Jesus to completely eradicate sin, to take it away, and then restore that person to wholeness. You know, imagine the the scenario here. Anyone who touched that leprous person would be in real fear of now becoming leprous themselves. Your contact with them gives you the disease. But with Jesus, the opposite was the case. Jesus' physical contact with that person relieved them of the disease. As I was putting down these more technical answers, I'm driving home on Thursday night, and I thought, you know, there's probably one more maybe a bit simpler and a bit more obvious that your notes don't include. Why this particular miracle? Maybe it's simply because this man asked. Maybe because he asked Jesus. I don't know. I hate to argue points that are not in the text. I don't want to argue from silence. But maybe many others that got passed by never got on their knees. Risk everything. Push through the crowd and ask. I don't know. But I see Jesus doing something for this man that's beautiful. He touched him. No one does that. He responds to him. No one does that. And he asks. Then this interesting command in the text. You've probably wondered about it. Something you'll probably be discussing to some degree in your life groups next week. Why did Jesus command him this? Say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest. I mean, that's counterintuitive for us, right? Is it not? It's counterintuitive. I just did something awesome here. This disease, which was visible, now has a visible healing. This person who was unclean is now clean. This person who was untouchable just got embraced by me. I mean, that's good stuff right there. That's good promotional material. Get that out there. Get the word out. I mean, if that's us, we're Instagramming the heck out of that. Right? We're promoting it. That's our mentality. Let's get the word out. We love famous Christians, don't we? No matter how flawed they are. I mean, it doesn't matter. If an athlete says something that's even nebulously, seemingly kind of sort of Christian, we love it. We'll, we'll retweet that thing a thousand times. If we can find us a movie star with some very questionable story that came to Christ, oh man, we're all over that. But the average testimony, the everyday believer, is not so interesting to us. We love celebrity and fame. But Jesus tells him, don't tell anyone. Why? Well, let me give you some reasons very quickly this morning without belaboring the point. One, it's pretty clear in the scriptures that follow in the Gospels that Jesus very much understood the often selfish motives of the crowd. And sometimes he would even correct them for it, rebuke them for it. One of the great miracles that we see in the Gospels is the feeding of the thousands, John chapter 6. But afterwards, Jesus says about those people, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. What's he saying? It's pretty incredible that you can get a free meal, right? That's why you're following me. Whether it's just for food or just to see what I can do that's amazing, but it's not me that you're seeking. Jesus also understood something that the modern church really needs to understand, particularly with this emphasis on the supernatural, often bogus, nonsensical, ridiculous, making Christians look like fools to the rest of the world. Jesus understood that even the most amazing miracles are insufficient to create saving faith. They're insufficient. Think about it just for a moment. If there's ever a part of us that says, you know, if I could just see this, Oh, man, now I believe, you know, my friends and neighbors would believe if they could just see this. If I could see the dead raised, if I could just see someone who was lame made to walk that's for real, not just someone whose leg was half an inch shorter than the other one, but someone who was really the recipient of a miracle, I would believe. But, you know, it's, it's not always that way. Here's a conversation that the Pharisees, religious leaders had in John chapter 11. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. They didn't. They saw them and didn't believe. You see, Jesus knew that absent preaching, absent explanatory teaching, that miracles have little value. Unless there's someone to say what this means, what this displays, what this tells us about God. Even for his disciples, this was necessary. We'll see this later in Mark chapter 8, verse 17. Jesus said to the disciples, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And the second time they had to feed a multitude, they're still having the same issues, same problems. Jesus has to teach them what the miracles are for and what they mean. 
Perhaps a more simple answer is that Jesus was simply being strategic. He tells him not to tell anyone why. Well, the message of the gospel, preaching the good news of the kingdom, was primary. That's what Mark's gospel begins with. Jesus came telling the good news of the kingdom. Repent, believe the gospel, and then he said, follow me. That's the essence of Mark's gospel. He knew that preaching the gospel was his primary purpose, and with the spread of this fame, that would impede that. Why? Because now everybody's coming for a display. Everyone's coming for a sign, a miracle. And perhaps even Jesus understood that sending this man to Jerusalem out of the area of Capernaum where he was, sending him to Jerusalem where he would have to appear before the priests, where he could be pronounced clean and healed, perhaps that would do more to spread word of the Messiah King at the very center of society and religious life than having him running about the small towns around Capernaum. But we know the end result. His disobedience meant that now Jesus could hardly travel anywhere. He could no longer move about freely, and ministry was impeded. But what's most important about this text? What's most important about this text? I want you to look at where the leprous man began and where he ended up, and where Jesus began and where he ended up. We know that the law required, according to Leviticus 13 and 14, that those with leprosy were shut out from people and had to be in desolate places. Did you catch the end of the text there describing Jesus? Verse 45, he went out and began to freely talk about it, spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places. Jesus traded places with this man. It's the essence of the gospel. The very essence of the gospel Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Jesus took his disease and gave him health. Jesus touched him when no one else would touch him. He loved him when no one else would love him. He healed him when no one else would help him. He saved one that no one else considered worth saving. And he exchanged places, even to the point where now Jesus is the one in desolate places. And this man is moving freely about, telling everyone what Jesus had done. I think there are two beautiful implications of this story. One for believers, and one for those who are not yet believers. One for believers is this. There are people all over everywhere hurting broken. They may not be to us physical lepers, but they're people that are not noticed, not reached out to, not considered, not valued, not helped. And if we're not careful, our natural bent is going to be calloused indifference, cold indifference. Maybe we get a little jaded, a little cynical because we see so much hurt, we see so many problems, and maybe we have the Misconception that it doesn't really matter what we do because nothing's going to change. But I'm glad that that wasn't the mentality of Jesus. Why heal this one? What's going to change? Everything for him and his family and his future. My hope for you as a Christian today, as a believer in Christ, wanting to be like Christ, wanting to live in the kingdom of King Jesus, wanting to be an emissary of the king, is that you ask him to move your heart with what moves his, to open your eyes to what his see. And if there's never an emotional response, if there's never anything that makes you angry as a believer, I, I, we have this ridiculous notion, I think, that Christianity at its core is just being super nice. But there ought to be some things that you see that make you want to cry or yell or take action, clear a table, run a room of cheats out, like Jesus did in the temple, whatever it may be, there are things that ought to move us. What's yours? What's God going to show you and move you to do? The implication for people who aren't believers yet is this, and it's an amazing story, and I hope I've done it somewhat of justice today. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It doesn't matter how dirty, and I hate to even use the word, that you might perceive yourself. Unclean, untouchable. It really doesn't matter what others have said about you and how they've treated you. 
Because there is a compassionate, all-powerful king who's ready to reach down to you, to forgive you, to give you new life, to erase the past, to give you a different future, to undo what's been done. That is what he does. He's not simply a concept. He's not an ideal. He's not merely a creed. He's the king. He's the savior king come for you. What does it require on your part? The humble admission that you need what he alone can offer. To risk it all. To say, if you will, you can. And ask him. Will you come to him today? This is Jesus. This is Jesus for you. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning. It's all of us all over this room. Father, we are guilty so often as modern day Christians using so many empty cliches and tired phrases, things that we repeat almost mindlessly. But I'm not sure we really mean. Oh, I just want to live like Jesus. I just want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I just want to do what Jesus would do if He were me. But Father, I fear that we are guilty far more often than we have realized. And not responding with indignant pity. Righteous compassion. A holy desire to see wrong made right. Evil overcome. Injustice undone. And so we do nothing. And we go idly past. Father, forgive us for that. Stir us out of this slumber. Shake us out of this indifference. And move our hearts to action. May we be a people of action. And Father, I pray for anyone listening today, maybe here or later, might hear this message. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just grab their hearts. Say so you put up a lot of walls, but down deep inside you, you feel like this. You feel like there's no hope. You feel like nobody cares. You feel like things can't change. You become cynical and jaded about your own self. And whether you have identified as such or not, it's hopelessness and despair that marks your life. And you're out in a desolate place. Father, if that is so, I pray that they would see great mercy today in the person of Christ. Forgive us for not always being good displays of that mercy and not representing you well. But you are not like us. You're greater, so much better, higher, sweeter, more merciful, more kind and good, all powerful and perfect. And Father, through Christ, you offer them hope and healing and restoration. Father, if they would but come to you, those who are marked by us and others as unclean, you make clean. Father, that's what you've done for us. That's what you've done for every believer in this room. That's what we recognize and honored in communion today, that we who are unclean, we who are outside the camp, have been brought in. We who are enemies have been made sons and daughters. We who are called sinners are now called saints, not because of our righteousness, but because of His. Father, you can do that for anyone, anyone. And Father, I also pray for those who are hurting today with heavy burdens and significant needs, whatever they may be. And we'd be reminded of the simple faith of this man. If you will, you can. And may we trust your power and your goodness and throw ourselves at your mercy that your will be done. But Lord, may we humble ourselves enough to ask. So Lord, be glorified. As soon as you pray this morning, what's your response to Him? What does it need to be today? What do you need to do with what you've heard this morning? We're going to sing a song, a song of response, a song of affirmation of what we've heard today. And As we do, if you're not a believer yet, 
But you say, that man, that's me. I, I want to come to Christ. I want to humble myself and come to Christ. I want to be made clean before Christ, before God. I want to give you this opportunity. Come and take the hand of one of us, one of the pastors that will be standing here. I want to show, with, show you the, the good news of Christ right there in the Bible. What God's offer to you is, help you respond to it by faith today. Believers, seek God for the specific direction He wants to give you so that when we leave this place, we'd be doers of the Word, not just hearers. Father, be honored now in our response. Empower them, embolden them, lead them. Pray you make this time sacred. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we respond to Him.